the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This, as some of you know, is the third in the series of lectures on the uh, development of the Yiddish language and literature. And uh, this evening, I'm supposed to deal with the big three, the uh, classics of Yiddish literature with whom modern literature begins in a rather abrupt way. For those of you who attended the previous two lectures, uh, if you haven't retained any traumatic experiences from the weather, we'll recall that I spoke of the development of Yiddish from its uh, earliest inchoate stages to the primitive literature. And now I'm leaping over quite a large stretch of development. The period when literature in the time of the Haskalah or the Enlightenment came to Yiddish in a very uh, indirect and the imitative way, when the longing to be cultured was, in a sense, artificial. That is to say, its fulfillment was artificial. People were more concerned with being cultured than enjoying culture. It wasn't what uh, the psychologists would call an appetitional relationship. It wasn't the appetite that was so much uh, satisfied as the ambition of being a cultured person. Uh, there was something pathetic as well as artificial about the Haskalah, the feeling that the Jewish people had been left behind in the march of uh, civilization and modernization, and there was a great eagerness to catch up with the consequent uh, falsities of tone very frequently, and a falsification also, strangely enough, of the Yiddish language. Until, let us say, 1750, 1800, the Yiddish of the masses had been a healthy, down-to-earth folk language and then the intellectuals got in and felt that they had to write for the masses, but they didn't know the language in that intimate, folksy sense. And the result was, what with the tremendous influence of the German culture of those days, Yiddish in the hands of uh, many of the writers, in fact, most of the writers, began to take on a Germanic tinge. In order to be cultured, one had to give a Teutonic twist to Yiddish. A Freud, a woman, would be called a Frauenzimmer, which was a very dignified uh, German word. And uh, the pronunciation would be correspondingly distorted also. Uh, you go back to writers Isaac Mayer Dick, for example, who is forgotten and who is read nowadays only as part of the history of Yiddish literature. Now, there's a certain merit in him. He wrote a famous book, famous in its day, that is, The Schwarzer Junger Manchik, uh, in which uh, you had this Germanization of Yiddish very strongly represented. And in fact, the intellectuals, the genuine intellectuals and the genuine artists who became the founders of modern literature, and, as I said, at a single leap, all began by writing Hebrew. The three great men of Yiddish literature, the three pillars, the triad of Yiddish literature, Mendele, Mochas Forim, and uh, Yitzchak Leibush Peretz, and Shalom Aleichem, all began as Hebrew writers. And it was because of their 
intimate relationship with the, with the mass and also with their sense of form that when they turned to Yiddish they stripped it of its uh, Germanic pretentiousness and its uh, what you might call its uh, la de da style of writing for upper classes they were able to penetrate to the genius of the language and to give it form uh, in such wise that the Yiddish of today, the classic Yiddish of today, is substantially that Yiddish which was formed uh, over a hundred years ago by these three writers. Now, I'm in a bit of a quandary, in fact, I'm very much of a quandary with regard to these three writers, because you can't cover even one of them in a single evening's talk and here I am trying to give you the essence of the three of them and what I'm going to do is really to neglect Shalom Aleichem because he has become so familiar uh, to readers that he overshadows the others with some injustice uh, because even without Shalom Aleichem the Yiddish literature of 1870 to 1915, 16, 18, 1918, I think was the year when Mendel died, would have been a very considerable one. But he stands in the same relationship that epoch of Jewish literature as Shakespeare does to the Elizabethans. We forget that there were great Elizabethans without Shakespeare, although not in Shakespeare's class. And so I'm going to concentrate this evening on the writings of Mendel to try and give you some specimens in Yiddish and in English and of Peretz and to give you some idea of their relationship to the folk and to literature. Now what you have to bear in mind that most Yiddish writers were aware of a mission. There was no such thing among them as art for art's sake, a feeling of independence, uh, of moral consequences, expressing their souls, you know, inviting their souls to self-expression uh, without regard to the problems of the people. That didn't exist. Even Shalom Aleichem, who, gave, who came nearest to being the artist uh, pur sang, uh, the artist as such, was very deeply involved in the condition of the Jews and he wrote always with an eye to their improvement. In the case of Mendele and of uh, Peretz, this feeling of a mission and of a public responsibility of uh, having to carry the burden of the development of the folk was very strong and sticks out from their work and very often imparts a dualism to their work. Mendele was a social critic as well as an artist. Uh, he was a satirist, but he satirized not out of contempt and out of derision or out of a feeling of superiority. He satirized out of the anger born of uh, frustrated affection. And you must remember that the shtetl which we now idealize and which we've represented with a very sloppy sentimentality in a musical like uh, Fiddler on the Roof was a very sturdy, earthy thing. If you go to see Fiddler on the Roof with its uh, saccharine qualities and its... Uh, attractive, mushy melodies, everything is sweetness and light. Even the pogrom is a nice one. They give you a very nice, gentle pogrom. The um, policeman comes on, gives somebody a little push and says, here's a pogrom. So he says, all right, that's a pogrom, I'm going away. You come from such a performance with a notion uh, that it was a rather jolly little thing, the shtetl, a gingerbread performance. Now, the shtetl was a very vivid and vigorous growth. There was much in it that was squalid. Uh, 
much that was repulsive, and of course, much that was attractive and highly spiritualized. The odd thing about the shtetl was that it didn't conform to what the sociologist would like to make of it, namely, a mixture. The shtetl was not a mixture, it consisted of two extremes. The ugly extreme and the attractive and radiant extreme. You had a life of uh, frightful poverty, snobbishness on the one at the one end. At the other end you had remarkably high spiritual qualities which created a tremendous tension which is one of the features of shtetl life. And this is how one can explain, or at least how I explain, the dualism of uh, Mendele's works. Now, Mendele lived longer than the other two writers. He was born in, in 1837 and died in 1918 at the age of 81, and his life encompassed the life of the other two, namely of Peretz and of Shalom Aleichem. And he is more variegated than they, or rather, let me say, he shows those two extremes in a more violent, and more explosive form. The bitter satires that he wrote on the littleness, the pettiness, the comical uh, uh, limitedness of the life of the shtetl uh, was exemplified in the journeys of uh, Binyomen Ashlishi. I'll tell you what the word means. There were two Benjamins before. There was the famous Benjamin, who was the son of Jacob. And then there was Benjamin of Tudila, the great traveler of the Middle Ages. And here was Binyomen Ashlishi, Benjamin III, who made a tremendous voyage of discovery, just like uh, Benjamin of Tudila. Except that the tremendous range of his uh, discoveries uh, was confined to five or six little villages in all of which he made a startling uh, he found startling revelations of Jewish life and uh, his observations on the life of the Jews his uh, observations on the character of the traveler himself and of his wife reflect the scorn, the pained scorn, of the anguish as well as the anger of uh, Mendel himself. I'll give you an instance of the, I'll read to you a few passages, specimens of the writing, so that those of you who know Yiddish will see how over a hundred years ago, well over a hundred years ago, Mendele was already writing that modern homey Yiddish which is purified from the Germanisms and the stilted uh, would-be literary effects imported from the outside uh, that were characteristic of the Haskala writers. He describes these, one of these villages to which he gives the name of Tuneyadivke. And he says, As Mazol Ashteger Plutzlum a Freig geben a Tuneyadivke reden from Bannen, und wie er soi er is sich me farnes. Bleibt er trellis stehen, wie zu zu mischt, weiß nebach nicht, was zu empfern. Nur später a bissl kommt er zu sich und empfert bitte niemals. Ich, wie er soi ich lebe, ich, etz is da Gott, zu da ot do, was er lost nicht alle seine, äh, seine, äh, seine Bachefenischen. Er schickt zu einem, muss dann weiter weiterzuschicken, so ich euch ab, ab, fort, and so on. I'll give you the English translation of this. If, for instance, you were suddenly to ask a Jew of Tuneyadevke how he managed to make a living, the man would stand stuck till in, still in confusion, wouldn't have the slightest idea of what you were talking about, and then, when he came to after a while, he would answer naively, Me? How I make a living? How I support myself? Why, man, there's a God in heaven, isn't there? And he doesn't forsake his creatures. 
Right there is your answer. He's nourished us till now, and I suppose he'll go on nourishing. But still, you insist, what do you do? Have you got a trade of some kind, or a business, or a profession, or what? Praised be the holy name, right there, he answers. Take a good look at me, mister, right there. God be praised. I have a gift from his sweet name, a wonderful voice for prayer. So right there on the high holy days every year, I'm in great demand in the town that's around here for the additional prayers, that's for the musaf. <clears throat> and right there I've got something else. I'm a wonderful mohel, and there isn't my like anywhere in the world for making holes in matzahs. So right there I have a living. That is, with the help of a match now and then, when I'm the matchmaker, and collect, collect something right there. I'm telling you, take a good look at me. I've got my own seat in the synagogue, my regular seat, and what's more between you and me, and don't let it get about, I've got a little inn, and I milk that now and again. And I've got a goat which milks very well indeed. And there's a rich relative who lets me milk him a little bit when times are hard. So right there, you know, on top of everything else, there's a God in heaven, isn't there? And he's a father. And our Jews, aren't they the merciful children of a merciful father? Now, this is a picture of <clears throat> the economic condition of the shtetlach a hundred years ago, and for that matter, 70 years ago, before on the eve of their destruction. <clears throat> the shtetlach where poverty had sunk deep and where the Jews who had once to some extent been the mercantile class for the surrounding world were being displaced by a rising mercantile class in the non-Jewish world so that the Jew would have a shop from which he barely eked out a living and in addition he would try his hand at this and try his hand at that of course, the classic picture of that kind of Jew is to be found in Menachem Mendel, you remember, in Sholem Aleichem. I'll make a little digression here. Menachem Mendel was the Luftmensch par excellence of Jewish life. It happened that he began with a little Nadan when he married Shana Shendel, his wife. And that little Nadan, he lost at once on the stock exchange, and after that he tried his hand at everything under the sun. And everything that he tried failed. If he uh, decided to grow beets and become a sugar magnet, there was a tremendous beet harvest all over the country. If he decided to become a matchmaker, become a... a, a a shadchan, he would uh, often fail to find out what the sexes of the two proposed partners would be. Uh, he would hang around the railroad station, around the shul, around the restaurants. He'd go out in the morning swinging his little stick, the famous shtekla, which was, so to speak, the mace and the, um, the sword of the Luftmensch and he'd be out all day he would leave in the morning and he would come back in the evening with his knees shaking and his nostrils and his ears stopped with dust and what was he looking for some little transaction to pass by into which he would be able to dip his fingers and pull out a ruble or two to be the intermediary in some transaction, to arrange a loan, uh, to be the uh, borrower, to be the lender, to any sort of uh, commission that he might pick up anywhere. And the mystery of it was, how did he live? Shalom Aleichem manages to convey with infinite skill that a man lived and yet never earned a penny, never earned a ruble or a kopeck. And somehow he ingeniously evades the question of where did he get at least the little that he had to have. It was one of the mysteries of Jewish life, how those people got along. And it is in this little sketch that I've given you of the Jews of Tuniadivka that uh, Mendele fastens down the type. Or he gives us again... Another picture, I'm referring once more to Mendela. Another picture of the shtetl from the negative side. 
Es stellen sich mir vor, unsere kleiselich und stieblich Mischteins gesagt, wie er so sie sehen uns, wie er so mir fährt in See, in er so mir halt sie rein. Ich gehe vorbei durch See und es verschluckt mich in der Nose. Dort halten sich auf Ledegeer, Batlonen liegen sich dort ausgezogen auf die Bank. And so on. I'll give it to you now in English. I give you the Yiddish one to show you how modern and how uh, completely timeless it is. I call it in my mind's eye our little prayer houses and chapels. And God help us, what a sight they are. And how dirty they are. And what kind of order is kept there. I go down the alleyways and I have to hold my nose. Who will you find there but loiterers and loungers, lazy ne'er-do-wells, lie stretched out on the benches and tables, puffing at their pipes, making fun, uh, making fun uh, and telling of everything and everybody and telling stories the livelong day. Do you know what they are? They are worms of a certain kind, continuously sucking at something or somebody. Worms who live always on the labor of others. There are, if you like, a queer kind of banker who looks on all the houses in town as his property. There isn't a soul in town that doesn't owe them something according to their view. And they're forever collecting. You can count yourself lucky if you can squeeze out of them a deferment of payment. I see in my mind's eye innumerable beggars, takers, paupers, idlers, loafers, cadgers, mendicants, cripples, malamdim, householders, tiny little householders, God save the mark, of 20 years ago and last year and this year, boarding with their in-laws. I hear suddenly on the street a procession of musicians. First a rush of youngsters, helter-skelter, and behind them a big crowd accompanied by lighted candles. What is it? A wedding procession. They're conducting a young couple to the synagogue. They're ruining a boy bridegroom and a child bride. Children who have no idea what it's all about. And until late in the night, I see the processions, innumerable weddings, grandmothers clapping hands merrily, the crowd rejoicing, a wonderful celebration. Mazel tov, Jews. Mazel tov to your brand new idlers, your brand new candidates for Malama's jobs for a place in the lounger's club. Mazel tov to your new list of dirty laundry. Mazel tov to your new fresh shivering leeches. Get blood ready, Jews. Get blood ready and money, money, money. Now, I don't think you're going to find in uh, general literature harsher writing than that outside of the prophets or outside of uh, Dean Swift. But I'm giving you this section or this aspect of Mendele because I'm going to come, come to the counterbalancing aspect of Mendele, which is at the other extreme. And I'll tell you how it came about. He describes in one section the varieties of capsonim, the varieties of paupers, of poor people. You see, among non-Jews, a poor man is a poor man. He's a beggar, he's a mendicant, he's a, a ne'er-do-well. But among Jews, there were distinctions. There were distinctions which made the uh, poor classes a highly variegated canvas of experience and of psychological structure. He describes them as follows, foot paupers and wagon paupers, paupers of the cities, paupers of the villages and countryside, paupers clay koidish, that is hangers on of the synagogues and Judaism. They sit around in the shul, around the oven, they pretend to study, they are scholars, they teach a page of Mishnayis, they are read to say Kaddish or someone either in the synagogue or out on the cemetery. They can blow a chauffeur on the high holidays, examine mezuzahs and tzitzis to see if they are up to the specification. Jews with red handkerchiefs collecting for yeshivas, for brides, for Palestine, for widows, for orphans. These are the varieties of paupers uh, that he describes. And he is equally savage uh, when he speaks of the attitude of uh, these Jews on education, he represents a Jew admonishing his son, the little boy who wants to lie in the fields and uh, 
Enjoy nature. Just look at the sky, at the grass, at the little animals. It says, all right, nature, schmature. I suppose it's not too bad, though. If you want to look at it, the whole thing is just foolishness. It's silly to waste a moment's time on it, because what good can you get out of it? Still, though a grown man with wife and children and the living to make has no business fiddling around with nature, you can forgive it in a youngster. Go ahead, go for your walks in the woods back of the house if you must. Go and commune with nature, as they call it. Lie down in the grass if you must and stare at the insects, the little Moses cows, I think they call them, and look up at the bird schmerds. After all, a youngster is only a youngster and you don't expect him to be serious all the time. But remember, young rascal, don't overdo it. Don't forget, you little rogue, that a boy of your age has to study the Talmud. Nature here, nature there, but there's such a thing as the tractate on seeds, isn't there? And the tractate on contracts, and that's what counts. There's a savagery in that too, uh, which relates to the shtetl. But then something strange happened. Something, the bitter years came of the early 18... Eighties after the assassination of Alexander II, the pogroms. And a tremendous change came over Mendela. He saw the same material that he'd seen before, and he saw it under a totally different aspect. All of a sudden, these squalid Jews, these wretched surroundings, this miserable world of... Uh, Paupers and Malandam and Shatchonim was transfigured. And this education which he had derided with the absence of nature suddenly becomes a classic education to him. He wrote Schleimer Ben Chaim's, Schleimer Reb Chaim's, The Life of a Jew wrote it after 1883, after the great wave of pogroms that passed over Russian Jewry. And although it is the same thing, you recognize it, look at the difference in tone. He says, For years the childhood of little Shlomo was lived in another world, and long before his bar mitzvah he had accumulated as much experience as if he were Methuselah's age. Where hadn't he been? And what hadn't he seen? Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, Egypt, Persia, Shushan, the capital of Ahasuerus's empire, Egypt and the Nile and the desert and the mountains. It was an experience which his children of no other people ever knew. For the Jewish child sat in one place and his studies had nothing to do with the surroundings and the place he lived in. He could not tell you a thing about Russia, about Poland, about Lithuania, about its people, laws, kings, politicians. But you just ask him about Og, the king of Bashan, and Sichon, the king of the Amorites, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Ask him about the Euphrates and the Jordan. He knew about the peoples who lived in tents and spoke Hebrew or Aramaic, the people who rode on mules and camels. They went barefoot. They drank water out of pitchers. He knew nothing concerning the fields about him, knew nothing about wheat, rye, potatoes, and where he got his bread from, didn't know that such things exist as fir trees, pines, and oaks, but he knew about vineyards, date palms, pomegranates, locust trees. He knew about the dragon and the leopard, the turtle dove and the heart that panteth after the living waters. Briefly, he lived in another world. You see, it is the same thing, but, you know, they say... C'est le temps qui fait la musique. It is not said in derision here, it is said in acknowledgement, but with no intimation that uh, this new world, this world that was inaccessible to the people around him, uh, this world was uh, inferior to or um, in, no, in no way commensurate with a cultured and uh, profoundly sensitive life. But he goes even further. And here is where a kind of religious apotheosis sets in with Mendele. And I wish I could give you this in the tonality which really belongs to it. He describes an evening of Knetlach. Now, uh, you've got to imagine how this was carried out. Knetlach means the threads or the wicks of candles. 
And just as among uh, Americans you have a knitting bee or a quilting bee, you would have in the shtetl, in the Jewish village, a candle bee. The pious women would get together and pour candles for the synagogues and draw the wicks, see in knetlach. They would come from their houses to one particular house, one uh, hut, and there they would sit and there would be a fierzogerin, one of the women who was able to read or who had insight or knew from memory uh, the stories of the Bible and the stories of the Musa books and the admonitions of the Musa books would hold forth and the others would be busy melting the wax and drawing the threads through for the synagogues for the candles. And her voice would go something like this. Die Licht, was wir wollen machen in Schulerein, für den heiligen Namen wegen, und für die reine heiligen Schommers, sollen wir wecken die heilige Overs wie im Moos, sollen wir sehre Quorum für uns betten. And they would go on a long sing-song the whole evening, and I'll give you the English of it, and you will of course be astonished if you remember what went before, what the early writings of Mendele were. This transformation becomes incredible becomes becomes quite uh, impossible he represents this woman singing what he would have called in those days the foolishness and the superstition of the village singing these words judge of the world merciful god these candles which we are making for the shul for your dear and holy name's sake and for the sake of the holy souls, these candles, may they awaken the holy patriarchs and matriarchs and make them rise from their graves to plead for us, that no evil, no pain, and no suffering shall come upon us, and that the light of our husbands and of our children shall not be put out before their time, God forbid. As I draw out this thread of wick for our father Abraham, whom you saved from the fire of the furnace, so shall you purify us from sin, so that our souls may come before you unspotted as on the day when it entered our bodies. And for the sake of this thread, which I draw out for our mother Sarah, remember, O God, her anguish when they led her son Isaac to the sacrifice. Let her be a good pleader for us, so that our children may not be snatched away from us that they shall not be scattered far away like lost sheep. This was a reference to the choppers. They used to snatch Jewish boys away, some of you certainly know, to serve in the army, and those children were taken hundreds and thousands of miles away from their parents and very often forcibly baptized. Those were the cantonists. They remained an evil memory in Jewish life until this day. And she goes on, And for the sake of the thread which I draw out for our father Isaac, have mercy on us, O God, so that we may be able to bring up our children and afford a ready for him, so that they may shine and learn and have knowledge of the beloved Torah. And for the sake of this thread which I draw out in the name of our father Jacob, whom you rescued from his enemies, standing by him in the hour of his need. For his sake, help us as you helped him against all the slanderers and betrayers and accusers, so that they may become dumb and be unable to plot against us and blacken our name. Help us so that on the day of judgment a good sentence may be pronounced for us and for our husbands, so that we shall not remain widows nor our children become orphans. And for the sake of Solomon, who built the temple and prayed therein, that when a stranger comes, the son of an alien people, and offers up prayer, his prayer, too, shall be accepted. For the sake of Solomon, O judge of the world, keep open the gates of heaven for my prayer, and let me be thought of 
I and my husband and my children and all good people and remembered for the good. Amen. And so she would go on the whole of the evening while these candles are being poured and cooled and set aside. He reproduces her chant and then he adds as a commentary these strange words. Let him laugh now who can. Let him if you can get the words out, say that it is all foolishness. Let there be many such lights. Let there be no end of such passionate emotions, such feeling, such noble light. Let there be more of these pure, deep-felt words of such prayer, of such love for Torah and wisdom and friendliness to mankind, to all the world of humanity. And where do you find all this, I ask? Among these Jewish women, plain, simple, ordinary women, Women who, if you look at them from without, they seem coarse and ignorant, souls of no account, who, if you see them in the marketplace, you would dismiss them with a glance. Would that there were countless millions of such women with such feelings and uttering such words. Let those other ones, let them hear and let them know what a Jewish heart is. Let them know and lose speech. And then you ask yourself with an indulgent smile, what does he mean by let those other ones actually means the man that he himself was years ago because he was full of derision for them he spoke of them uh, in the uh, most contemptuous terms and all of a sudden he forgets it he's like all converts naturally he's uh, much more royalist than the king and more catholic than the pope uh, he is filled with a love and admiration and affection and glories in these simple women and the fact is that as he had done them injustice before, he was now making up the measure by forgetting uh, what he had said and reproaching himself in the guise of other people. He gives us a picture of the home of Reb Shlomo ben Chai, uh, Reb Chaim, uh, <coughs> of the Jewish home in its poverty, filled with the learning and with the search for knowledge and with the richness of the tradition pervading all of its corners and you come away from that book and you marvel actually looking back at all that Mendel has written you marvel at the ambivalence at the dualism of the Jewish people and at the double extremes which it manages to achieve uh, both in its sordidness and in its nobility. Now, there was the same kind of duality in Peretz. But he wasn't the savage satirist that Mendel was. He was much more sophisticated. And what he wrote was with a subtle and uh, flexible pen. He had the same view of these uh, lazy ne'er-do-wells whose women very often made the livelihood such as it was for them. And I'm going to read you a sketch of his characteristic of the masculine in him. That is to say, of the Jew, the educated Jew who wants to lift up the Jewish masses and who wants to bring education to them and wants to shame them out of their habits. It's a very strange fact that nine-tenths of what Peretz wrote wasn't really literature. It was educational material. He wrote on chemistry and on physics and on geography and on physiology and on history great reams of stuff which he published for the benefit of the masses. And he also wrote these gentle satires, which in a way are even more effective than the savage ironies of Mendele. Here is a sketch which some of you may have read. I'm not going to read you from the well-known parts of Peretz, but lesser-known part, but which some of you may have come across called Mendel Brynus. 
Uh, Jews were very often called by their first name and the name of the mother. The name Brynin, for example, which is familiar to some of you, was really a Brynis originally. And he describes here a gentle character, a fine Jew, what they used to call a Shainer Eid. They called him Mendel Brynis. That is Brynis Mendel, not after his mother, but after his wife. For this was in the days before Jews were compelled to find themselves surnames. He was what they call a tent dweller, like our forefather Jacob, in contradistinction, that is, to Esau, the rough and uncouth huntsman. A tent dweller, which means a fine, quiet, studious example of a Jew. No great scholar, to be sure. Not for him the subtle disquisitions and problems of the Talmud. He was content with the simpler passages, the legends, the aphorisms of the sages, the morality books and the psalms. To these he gave his heart, to these and to pious deeds. His house was always open to the homeless traveler. No morning passed but what he dropped a coin into the charity box for scholars who have settled in the Holy Land, and no benevolent enterprise could get underway in town without Mendel's name on the list. Perhaps a preacher would come to town. Mendel would put him up. Perhaps a collection would be started for matzahs, for potatoes, for firewood, for anything at all concerning the poor. Mendel would don his gabardine, pick up his big walking stick, and accompany the rabbi from door to door. Mendel considered it a special merit to carry the box with his own hands, even though the synagogue beadle was in the procession. His days were filled with activity from dawn to dusk. There were psalms to be recited, a page of the Mishnah to be studied, morning prayers to be said, good deeds to be done, the midday meal to be eaten, grace to be intoned, then afternoon prayers and evening prayers and prayers before falling asleep and midnight prayers. Mendel Brynus was not what you would call clever. When he was a boy in Cheder, they used to call him Mendel Looney. Then when he grew up and married, the description was softened down to Mendel Simpleton. Later on, when he had finished the traditional years of keep, to which a young husband is entitled from his father-in-law, when he had set up house for himself and his wife opened a grocery store and made lots of money, he was promoted to Mendel Brimus. And since he never got in anyone's way, never uttered a mean or angry word, and was always doing something for somebody, people were willing to forget what they once called him, and nobody laughed out loud when he used to ask at every other sentence, I'm not foolish, am I? In fact, wouldn't you say that I'm quite clever? Bryna was a devoted and loving wife to Mendel. She had but one ambition, to serve as his footstool when he sat upon the throne that was surely waiting for him in paradise. In the meantime, on this earth, nothing was too good for her, Mendel. The daintiest foods, the finest clothes, and Bryna worked like a donkey to support him and to feed and clothe the children, of whom there were four, two sons and two daughters. Pending her translation to paradise, she asked for nothing save the sight of her Mendel occupied in the fulfillment of his pieties. Her heart swelled within her when she looked out from the door of her store and saw her Mendel in the dignified procession down the street, the charity box in his left hand, the big walking stick in his right hand. Bryna had a wonderful seat of her own in the women's gallery of the synagogue. She sold it for next to nothing and paid a huge price for another seat in a much less distinguished place only because from there she could watch her Mendel at the Sabbath service and see him when he was called up to the pulpit for the reading from the scrolls of the law. Bliss welled up in her when she saw her Mendel leaning over to the cantor, murmuring into his ear, telling him to announce to the congregation that he was donating 18, that is, 18 high kopek to the synagogue for the health of his wife, Bryna. And what bliss it was to go with Mendel on Sabbaths and holy days to the synagogue. When they reached the synagogue steps and had to part company, he to proceed to the men's section downstairs. 
she to the women's gallery. She would take leave of him and then turn round to see her men lift his legs from step to step. And after service, she would wait for him on the, sa on the same spot. And when he uttered and approached his hearty good shamas, she would blush for happiness for all the world as if they had just come out from under the bridal canopy. Bryony knew well enough that her husband was no expert in the trashy nonsense which is called worldly wisdom. There, in the synagogue study house among the pietists, he was the big man. But the everyday world was her domain. And so when Mendel used to propose that they sell out the store and go to live in the Holy Land, she would answer sweetly, No, no, Mendel, one doesn't sell one's livelihood like that. Maybe some far off day when we'll have married off the children, when we'll have provided our sons-in-law with a few years of keep, when we'll have grandchildren and perhaps even a great-grandchild or two, maybe then we'll consider it, maybe then we'll turn the store over to the children. And Mendel, who knew that in worldly matters his wife was nothing short of a genius, nodded agreement. One day Mendel came home from the synagogue study house in melancholy mood. Look, Bryna, he said, a summons from the heavenly court, and he showed her a gray hair in his beard. Bryna comforted him. Don't talk foolishness, Mendele. You don't understand these things. My father, God rest his soul, was gray at 50, and yet may his virtues bring you long life. He bring us long life, Mendel corrected her. Bring us long life, said Brian. He lived another 30 years. Ah, other days, other people. We are a weaker generation, said Mendel, and looked down sadly. Brian had talked him out of his sadness and made up her mind to feed him better than ever. That same day, she ordered an extra half pound of meat for supper. Well, well, Bryna, said the butcher. Important guests, prospective in-laws. Good luck, Bryna. No, no, she answered. We're a weaker generation, that's all. And at mealtimes, uh, she would coax Mendel to take a little more. Mendel would taste this. It's delicious. And looking into his eyes, she would think, God strengthen him. Weaker generations. That's all that we are. And then she would add, you need strength, Mendel, to do all our whole studying. I don't have to eat as much as you. What have I got to do all day long but sit in the store with my hands in my lap? Or maybe I'm in the kitchen standing over the stove. And if a customer comes in, what is there to do but weigh out a pound of beans or grits or flour? And if no customer comes in, well, there's nothing at all to do. And so I don't have to eat as much as you. And Mendel thought, Bless my soul, she's quite right. All the things I must attend to, so many psalms every day, the prayers, the page of the Mishnah, the collection box, I do need more food. I won't read you the rest of it. I'll send you to the original. But it ends with the death of Bryna and Mendra looking down at her and wondering, why did she die? She had an e such an easy life. There was nothing for her to do, and then she goes and dies on him. Absolutely incomprehensible to him. As you see, the satire here is uh, much more refined, much more delicate than in uh, Mendela. But uh, it is not less cruel. And then you get the other side of uh, Yal Peretz. In stories that you are all familiar with, all of you have read Bonche Schweig, Silent Bonche, or Bonche the Speeches, or Oib Nisht Hecher, the story of the rabbi, I need only remind you, who used to go out early in the days, in the penitential ten days, early, early in the morning, and do deeds of charity among Goyim, and how a certain Litvak, who had been told that this rabbi ascends to heaven and was very skeptical, which is the way of Litvaks, hid under the bed and followed him one morning and saw him doing these things and became himself a chassid and follower of this rabbi. That story is familiar to you and many another. But what I'm going to read to you in order to give you a glimpse of the tenderness with which 
Peretz treated the uh, Hasidic lore and with what profound understanding is a quite different story that not much attention has been paid to and which nevertheless is in my opinion uh, one of the richest. I'm just looking for it for a moment. I seem to have misplaced it. It is one that mixes satire and tenderness in a peculiar way that no other Jewish writer has achieved. There is love in it, but love that has a sort of tongue-in-cheek slyness, much more sophisticated than anything that either Mendel or Sholom Aleichem could have written. But it grows out of what might, one might call a grandfatherly tenderness toward the weaknesses and the nobilities of the Jews. It's called the Rabbi of Chelm. It said, Satan, the evil one, the enemy of mankind, the tempter and destroyer, sat one day in, the pri in his private office idly examining his account book. He sat there at ease, one leg dangling over the other, and the kindly, complacent smile was on his lips. And his fingers turned at random the leaves which bore the names of all the living souls on earth. And then suddenly his complacency vanished, and he clapped his palms together. He had come upon the page bearing the name of the Rabbi of Helm, and it was blank as blank could be. At the sound of the clapped hands, a host of demon flunkies came running and crowded about the door, their tongues hanging out while they waited for a word of command. Send someone up, said Satan, and find out whether the Rabbi of Helm has many years to live. The demon flunkies vanished as swiftly as they had come. A quarter of an hour later, the report was handed in from the upper chamber. The days of the Rabbi of Helm were numbered. The thread of his life, worn thin to invisibility, was about to snap. It might happen tomorrow, it might happen the day after. Send for the recorder, said Satan. Enter the recorder, a bald-headed little goblin, light-footed and merry-eyed. A bow, a scrape, a smirk, and he seated himself cross-legged Turkish fashion on the sulfur smoldering floor. From one side he drew a bottle of blood-red ink reeking of sin and the new crow's feather. From the other, a parchment made from the skin of an atheist. The recorder spat in his palm and threw a submissive look at his master. Ready? Satan uncrossed his legs and leaned forward in his armchair. The recorder stuck out a fiery tongue. The quill flew over the parchment. A report and claim were indicted to the court of heaven. Whereas we are told in Holy Scripture, no man liveth who shall do good and no evil, and whereas there is among the living the rabbi of Helm who stands with one foot in the grave and the debit side of his ledger is blank, therefore in order that the Torah of Moses shall be true and shall remain true, let the rabbi of Helm be delivered into the power of the evil one. Back came the answer. See Book of Job, chapter 1. That case, Satan remembered without difficulty. It meant he could do whatever he wanted with the rabbi of Helm, save that against the man's life he could not put forth his hand. Such as the rabbi's days were, few or many, they had to run their course. But how was he to do with the rabbi of Helm what he had once done with Job? For Job had been a mighty man of substance, and the rabbi of Helm a widower, alas. His children married out. And it is written in Ezekiel, the fathers shall not die in the place of the sons. Nothing doing there. As for flocks of sheep and herds of cattle, the poor men hadn't even a goat for milk. Nor could Satan afflict him with boils. He had them already. What trials and torments could you visit on the rabbi of Helm? Some little lust of his, muttered Satan, licking his chops. Some tiny desire 
some obscure appetite. He stretched out his hand, lifted the bell which was made from the skull of a sophist, and rang. The room filled with demon flunkies. Whom shall we send to tempt the rabbi of Helm from the true path? Me, me, me. The competition is fierce and no wonder. Promotion waits for the demon who can pull this one off. There's almost a riot. Finally, they draw lots. A couple of minor imps get the lucky numbers and they are off amid a chorus of mazel tov, mazel tov. The sun shone bright that day on the marketplace of Helm, crowded with Jews who had nothing to do. They stood about in groups, buying and selling the skins of rabbits and hares that hadn't been caught, cases of eggs that hadn't been laid, timber from trees that hadn't been felled. You don't have to laugh, that's just called selling futures on the modern stock exchange. Timber from trees that hadn't been felled. Suddenly the earth beneath their feet began to tremble. A crack as of nearby thunder split the air and the wagon burst into the marketplace, scattering Jews right and left. A strange and unknown wagon, and stranger still is its behavior. High up in front stood the driver, a ragged cap on his head, a red girdle about his loins, pulling like mad at the infuriated horses, and behind him stood the passenger in decent black gabardine and fur cap, holding the whip in his right hand and cracking it over the head of the horses. The driver pulled the horses back. The passenger urged them on. Now and again, the passenger drove his left fist into the driver's back. Now and again, he put his fingers to his lips and emitted a piercing whistle which made the horses start as if they had been shot. And meanwhile, the driver was wailing at the top of his voice, Jews, have pity on me, save me, save me. And before anything could be done, the wagon had passed through the marketplace, followed by a stream of sparks. The onlookers stood paralyzed, murmuring, God have mercy on us. The wagon drew near the slaughterhouse, and the huge dogs that hung about the place sprang at the horses' throats. The muscular butcher boys came running out, grabbed the reins, and were on the wagon in a trice. The crowd drew near. What's the meaning of it all? Nothing much. Just a little difference between the men on the wagon. The passenger in the decent black gabardine gasps that the driver has gone mad. He wants the horses to dawdle and graze when it's a matter of life and death to get to the next market town without delay and sell the package of diamonds. At the mention of diamonds, the crowd falls back respectfully. But the next instant, confusion returns. The driver begins to yell that he's not the driver at all. The other man is the driver. They've come a long way. In the middle of the road, the real driver put a knife to the real passenger's throat, forced him to give up the package of diamonds, and here they are. The passenger denies every word of it. He is the passenger. The other man is the driver. Who's to make head or tail of it? The crowd pulls the wagon round and leads it with passenger and driver to the rabbi's cottage. Let the rabbi of Helm find out. And the rabbi of Helm interviews each man separately and privately. The plaintiff first, the man dressed like a driver. And he talks like a driver too, and looks like one. Coarse, massive, ignorant, a man of the woods, a voice that no cheder chant has ever tempered. But that is not enough for the rabbi of Helm. He cross-examines. What's the value of your package of diamonds? Rabbi, don't ask me. I'm an ignorant man. Can't sign my name. Can't add up a column of figures. But God has been good to me, and so I'm a dealer in diamonds. How much money is there in the bag the other man took from you? Rabbi, I never count my money. You know it's bad luck. The man is sent out from the room. He, a wealthy merchant, unbelievable. But the Rabbi of Helm sighs a heartbroken sigh for the wickedness of the world and asks that the other man the passenger be sent in. And what a difference from top to toe, the man of learning. The rabbi feels him out with half quotations. The man caps them instantly. Talmud and commentaries. Rabbi cries the man, what's the good of all this? I'm an hour here. And opening the bag, he pours out on the table a heap of diamonds mixed with gold coins, blazing diamonds and flaming gold. Half yours and half mine, if you'd say it's all mine. A faint scream from the rabbi's lips. Robber! 
The crowd breaks in the door. Where's the driver? Where's the passenger? Where are the diamonds and the coins? Gone, like wisps of smoke. And all hell mutters, magic or a nightmare, God have mercy on us. Meanwhile, below, Satan is furious. Imbeciles, clumsy dolts. Maybe he's not beyond being bribed, but not that way, not in the open, with a chance of being found out. Do you take him for an idiot? The two stupid imps are sentenced to a year of their own sulfur and brimstone. A second meeting is called. This time, there is less enthusiasm, no yelling of me, me, me. An elderly demon with a clear head and a long record accepts the assignment. Now, if you want to know what happens, you'll have to go to the book. Because I have no more time. But this is the Hasidic story, I might say, in excelsis. This is the Hasidic story of temptation of human resistance and how the rabbi of Helm finally did fall and how strangely... This is Hasidic moralistic penetration to the heart of problems. And there is... In this approach to human relations, this peculiar approach of the Hasidic world, so vast a difference from the world of the Haskalah in which he labored, in which Yal Peretz labored most of his life, that you wonder that he, there isn't a kind of schizophrenic note in his writing, but there isn't. Now, this duality was characteristic of both men, as it was characteristic of a great many Jews. The one in whom it manifested itself least was Sholem Aleichem. And not because he wasn't a satirist, there's much of his material which is satirical, but he was far more of the folk than the others were. He had never received, as the others had, the high formal external education. And therefore, he himself was tainted, so to speak, with the folk's lower qualities as well as with the folk's higher qualities, transmuted in him, of course, into the supreme artist. Now, I'm already come to the end of the allotted time, but if you wish to remain for some questions about these writers, I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, will you come forward? I, it's difficult for me to hear from here. Yes, he wrote in the dramatic form. He wrote in the case and he wrote in the poetry in the corridor of the entrance of the synagogue. He used those forms and uh, that was characteristic of his Hatshala style. He borrowed from Goethe. If you read the one hundred map of Goethe's power at the end of the first book and compare it with the drama uh, in Alton Mark, in the old Mark, where you can see the tremendous influence of Goethe. If I have more time, I'll tell you something about the development of the light. Uh, a great fortune he is having with the young man. A rich man died and left him his library. And what Paris did was to go to that library and read through it, go through it as if he were uh, a sort of paperwork. He didn't read it in that. He began it. He began it. Whatever came first, archaeology, and he was finishing up with zoology around the whole of the island. He had a colossal memory and a rich for languages. And the fact that he did not come out from Sushi Adel is a great tribute to the Romans who were living in his mind. Because he had a lot of enormous store of information. And uh, it precipitated in him uh, this duality that I've spoken about. And it is in the play that he shows most, as I heard it this morning, that he shows the influence of the outside world, whereas the inside world, the inside world, the Hasidic world, is shown in the post of the night, in the post of the and in the Hasidic story. <laughs> uh, 
Yes. 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 Yes
Any other questions? Yes. Well, the Shabbat Aleichem is the easiest to transmit. You can read none of these writers without some background of Jewish knowledge. Forty years ago, there was a translation of Shabbat Aleichem, and nobody read it. And the reason is that forty years ago, the American born Jewish public is from the East of England and the East of The thing is that the American born public, Jewish public of the day, is better informed about Jewish life than the American born public of 40 years ago. I'm not speaking of the immigrant public which came over. Obviously, they knew that world. For those who were born here, this is. Now there is more Jewish knowledge among the American born. And so some of them became accessible. For you would need more Jewish knowledge to get into the interiors of the other, of Benjamin and the Senate. I believe their time will come. It is unfortunately a terrible laziness on the part of the Jewish public, uh, a deterioration of the will to learn. Uh, which is uh, gradually, however, being mended. And I think the time will come for those of us that have certain other things like that. Okay. The fact that uh, these works are more appreciated by the Orthodox Jews or by the Jews, I'm not aware of any such decision. Anybody who is literally based on a knowledge, a modicum of knowledge of the Jewish life, enjoys these works. I'm not aware of the distinction uh, between the uh, Orthodox and the Reformed uh, in that, or for that matter, the non believers in that respect. Yes, ma'am. Well, he is not Yiddish literature. As a manual is Jewish literature in English, and uh, as I do, very considerable merit. Who too will someday come back, I think. But I tell you to know that in the world is being swamped by the uh, Jewish self psychoanalysis by this book. Everybody who comes to the back out is reading these books. And he himself comforts us to pass upon human problems by virtue of them. It's a phase. Uh, I've seen other phases. Uh, this phase will pass, but the immune book will not. Oh, yes, of course. Well, it's really not the same. It's a useful book. And contains a lot of information, but uh, doesn't belong to the Yes. Whereas I would place the upper class in the midst of the modern writers, and the whole host of writers, I think they can't set down. I think you would flee because if you learn about these, you go to the other. But I have a master of man of considerable merit. Uh, he's translated to English and has uh, been like the others very sadly neglected. But he's certainly a figure, uh, a respectable figure in the field of Yiddish literature. Well, I wish the class is dismissed and we will check the news. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.